I'd like to talk about fruit and the communities of animals that disperse them. So at this time of the year, in the autumn, trees and bushes have flowered and created seeds. And the next stage is to ensure those seeds are dispersed so they find new patches where the next generation can grow. And a very common strategy, as shown in these birch trees up here, is to produce very light seeds that are then just carried away by the wind to find new sites. Another strategy, as shown by this oak tree here, is to produce acorns. And so acorns will be um, carried away by jays and then buried in the ground or carried away by squirrels in North America. And those um, uh, and they won't find all of those squirrel, those acorns again, and they will grow and produce the next generation. A different strategy is to produce fruit, uh, and that tends to be done by shorter species, uh, but it's a very common strategy. Just along this hedgerow here, there's an abundance of different fruiting species. So a very common one is the hawthorn, and here's a great mass of hawthorns. Uh, this is a very common uh, uh, fruit taken by winter thrushes, mainstay of the frugivorous population. There's also blackberries, and blackberries, uh, the fruit has disappeared now, uh, but in the summer that's taken by uh, thrushes, blackbirds and song thrushes, not by the winter thrushes, uh, it, the, the fruit has died by the time they arrive, but also by robins and warblers and so on. And then there are the, uh, the field uh, rows, uh, the dog rows, uh, the dog rows uh, as in here, and the dog rows are uh, rather hairy, uh, they're full of tannins, and so they just tend to be taken by the larger thrushes, uh, field fares and blackbirds. So all the fruit you can see up here is bird dispersed, and bird dispersed fruit tends to be conspicuous, uh, it's often bright red, um, it doesn't smell of anything because birds don't have a good sense of smell. Uh, it's positioned so that it can, can easily be picked off. And it's very different from mammal dispersed fruit. Mammal dispersed fruit tends to be dully coloured uh, and smelly. So mango, mangoes, for example, are dispersed by elephants. Uh, in temperate areas like Britain, we tend not to have much mammal dispersal. Um, we have um, crab apples, which are dispersed by deer and wild pigs. I'm going to walk down this lane and see what other species we can find. Uh, so here's a dogwood, uh, which has small blackberries uh, fed on by thrushes and starlings and robins. And then there's elder. Uh, which produce large numbers of similar blackberries. Uh, here's the elder, but um, uh, these come out earlier in the year and have disappeared by now. Uh, so these are favoured by birds in the summer, by warblers and robins and so on. And then the spindle is usually a rather inconspicuous bush, but then in the autumn it produces these rather bizarre f flowers and fruit and these are dispersed largely by robins, so it's almost a robin specialist. And this fruit is seasonal. So these blackberries here, uh, well past their best, very little to feed on at the moment, but there's an abundance of fresh fruit here from this uh, dog rose or all this hawthorn up here, just all this fruit at its prime. But then there's fruit that's yet to come. So here there's some ivy 
uh, and these berries are developing now. And it's these evergreen species, the holly and the yew and the ivy, that's still growing, still photosynthesizing, so can still put energy into fruit. And a lot of the winter fruit is from these evergreen species. And these, um, they're full of fat, uh, they're very nutritious, and so very important for a range of thrushes and robins uh, and pigeons. And then there's the blackthorn, whose fruit, uh, the slow, is very large, has a big seed, uh, tastes horrible. So the dispersers of this will be the thrushes, um, and uh, it tastes rather horrible, so that given the choice, thrushes would much rather feed on hawthorns, but as those run out during the winter, they will then turn and then start feeding on slows. And they're then an important part of the diet. So how, so looking at these different species, we can see there's a whole diversity, a diversity of sizes uh, and a diversity of species that feed on them. Um, and it seems that if you look at the community, the community of fruit in Britain tends to be larger than the fruit in the southern Mediterranean. Uh, and the reason for that seems to be that there are more thrushes up here and there are more warblers in the Mediterranean. So how does that process occur? Well, these, these plants have been around for millions of years. It's not some recent co-evolution. The explanation almost certainly is that as the Ice Age retreated and species started moving north, then they would be feeding on fruit and carrying those plants further north. And the, in, the, in the more northern regions, there'd be no warblers because they've all migrated south. They tend to eat on, feed on insects and um, uh, don't survive the winter. Uh, but the thrushes would be up there and dispersing the fruits, and so there'd be larger fruits further north and further south, where there'd be warblers, there'd be smaller species of fruit. And so that, distribute, that dispersal pattern almost certainly brings about these differences in the community. And then if you go to tropical areas, there are really large fruit. And that's because there's a whole suite of fruit-eating specialists, parrots and monkeys um, uh, and hornbills, a whole range of different species. And they're species that are large, will feed on large fruit, and so uh, there are trees that are covered in fruit and a very different system from the sort of things we're talking about here. And also in the Amazon you have fruit that are dropped into the flooded forests and carried by fish, a completely different system. So the communities we have here and we've seen are dispersed by different species. And how do we know that? We know that largely through very detailed studies. There have been remarkable studies in southern England, other remarkable studies in the South Mediterranean, where people have watched uh, bushes and seen exactly which uh, species visit. But a, a more modern approach now is to use DNA. So if you can find a bird dropping and you can find the seed that's in that dropping, you can then know that it's been dispersed and then you can use DNA to identify the species of bird that has dispersed that seed. And there are detailed studies of this showing how that affects the dispersal within, within woods and outside woods, etc. But then an even more sophisticated approach is if you collect samples from the different plants, the different individual fruit-bearing plants, you can then study their DNA. And then when you find a dropping, you can identify 
the bird that's dispersed it, the species of bird. But you can also identify which individual plant it came from, so how far it has dispersed. So you can identify the exact species that's diverse, uh, dispersing it and the nature of dispersal. So these sorts of approaches are revolutionizing how we study herbivory, how we study frugivory. So um, uh, dispersal by frugivores is critical for the dispersal and so the survival of these fruit-bearing species. But also these fruit-bearing species are important for a large community of species of much of their diet is, is fruit. So it's a really important co-evolutionary process.